between the star and planet causes variations in the light curve that are periodic with the phase, phase of the planet. And also the day side of the planet contributes to changes in the light curve as the fraction of illumination changes throughout uh, the planet's orbit. The combination of these effects results in an out of transit light curve that can be uh, modeled with just a simple double harmonic sinusoidal model. Um, for the systems that follow this simple model, you can constrain the companion's mass and atmospheric properties. So that means for my project, I am using a phase variation analysis on all of the known and candidate transiting planets that have been observed with TET. The goal of my project is to evaluate the usefulness of a phase variation analysis for exoplanet characterization and planet candidate vetting. And then the secondary outcome of my results is to is that we identify unusual phase variation signatures, like this one, um, that may be caused by other astrophysical effects. In my poster, I use the test uh, light curves of several known planets to just demonstrate my analysis and then also highlight some preliminary results. And I show off examples of both typical and atypical phase variation signatures. If you're interested in learning more about phase variations, come find me anytime throughout the week and come check out my poster. Thank you. I get to start talking right away? There we go, all right, cool. Hi everyone, my name is Peter Gow, I'm a postdoc at UC Berkeley, and I want to, just for the next two minutes, take your eyes off of Earth analogs and onto Titan analogs for a moment. Uh, so we published a paper last year uh, led by Juan Laura uh, looking at the atmospheric dynamics and photochemistry of Titan analogs around different stellar types. And here is this one, uh, one um, uh, result showing that uh, the abundances of C2 hydrocarbons and nitriles, which are pre uh, the, the originators, uh, the sources of hazes and also other organic molecules, differ by factors of almost uh, of 100 uh, for, due to the different shapes of the stellar spectra. So this was a fun little study, and it got us thinking about uh, how these planets would actually evolve around different stellar types, particularly around M dwarfs. And uh, it's just very, very simple, just looking at the evolutionary curves of M dwarfs uh, for Titan-like planets, uh, if you wind the time back, they were actually habitable uh, during the really uh, the, pre, uh, the high luminous phases in the pre-main sequence. So, you know, I think this is just interesting to think about because one, these planets would not have lost their volatiles. During that, um, during that time, and also, if they were habitable and they actually developed some kind of biosphere, you know, this is kind of getting out there, uh, it might have been preserved in the deep freeze since then. And, you know, this is, this is fun, but it's not just for fun, it's not purely academic, because we are beginning to find these planets around other stars. Uh, so, uh, very recently, we found Barnard star B, which receives twice the flux of Titan from its host star, and this is just a synthetic spectra of a Barnard star B, if it were a Titan analog, observed using Dubois A, uh, the 15 meter uh, behemoth. And you can see that we can pick out the methane features just extremely well. And you know, that's thanks to the Barnard B being so close uh, to us. So uh, if you're interested, come and talk to me. There's no poster on this, but you know, I, I'm free to chat. So thank you. Okay, back to Earth analog. Uh, my name is Mark Giovanazzi. I'm a rising second year graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. The project that I work on and I'm here to talk about is NEID. It's pronounced NUID. It's, uh, NUID means 2C in the native language Hono Odom, which is the uh, native land that the instrument will be built on later this year. Uh, so specifically, it's going to be a fixture at Wynn at Kitt Peak in Arizona. So that's where this is built. It's going to be the, um, what's the NASA NSF joint program. It'll be the most sensitive instrument of its kind. And what it will do is it's a Doppler spectrometer that will measure radio velocities around nearby, nearby stars. And its ultimate goal is to find the first Earth-like exoplanet around a sun-like star. So this is something we've already talked a lot about at this conference in our search for life. Um, optimally, well, so when we talk about radio velocities, let's talk about our own solar system. Jupiter is going to induce a wobble around our star at a rate of about 12 meters per second. But Earth induces a radio velocity a radio velocity around our star of just about 10 centimeters per second, so really small. Now to date, there's no instrument sensitive enough to measure this level of precision, and that's what NUID's going to do. 
In order to achieve it, Nuid uses a really impressive CCD, which I'm really happy to talk to you about by my poster, but, but uh, specifically it uses this uh, new method called dithering, which uh, this is not going to work. So come find me if you want to see what this movie would look like. But if you imagine that when your CCD is idle, it's sitting there constantly refreshing, waiting for you to give it a command to expose, and its temperature is relatively constant. Now, once that exposure starts, the CCD doesn't need to work as hard, right? It's, it's ready for a command. So it dips, and this dithering method allows us to keep that temperature stability, which is really the name of the game when we're looking for exo-Earth. Uh, so any of the astrobiologists in the audience, definitely come let me know what we at NUID can do to find you the best planets that we could possibly probe for life. Uh, stop by my post there. Come talk to me. Thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is Sean McClote. I'm a PhD student at the University of North Dakota Space Studies Department. Uh, it's a really great department. We do pretty much all things space, human space flight, life support systems, the space law, the implications of private space flight, and of course, planetary science and astronomy. Before I got started with my master's degree there, uh, the department had no exoplanet or astrobiology research to speak of, so I've been working very hard to bring that into the department's research portfolio. Amongst my many projects, or I have three projects I'm going to tell you about that I'm working on. One is using our observatory. We have two humble 40 centimeter telescopes that I am commissioning and characterizing to do test SG-1 uh, follow-up observations. Uh, ultimately, I'd like to uh, simulate some transits and really find out what the precision is we can get from our telescopes, uh, potentially collaborate with the physics department's telescope, and perhaps have all of the university's telescopes looking at one target to really get the best data that we can. Ultimately, I'm also going to use this commissioning data to make the case to the university to get us a bigger telescope, which may or may not be the best choice for the dark North Dakota prairie. Next slide, please. Uh, I am also extremely lucky to work, work with uh, Dr. Carolina von Essen, who is in Denmark. She is going to share with me some high-resolution transmission spectroscopy data for the planet KELT-10b that I'm going to process uh, and analyze and hopefully build off that for more PhD work. I am also, I have a germ of an idea that I've mentioned to some of you about uh, biosignatures, particularly how we might be able to look at biosignatures in multi-planet systems and how whether or not a particular pattern between the planets may or may not be able to increase or decrease the posterior probability to more confident levels, whether it is a biosignature or not a biosignature. So if that sounds appealing to you or you have advice on where to take that idea, uh, please come talk to me. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eckhart Spaulding. I'm a graduate student at the University of Arizona. Um, I work on instrumentation related to the direct imaging of exoplanets. I say related to because we're still trying to get down to the sensitivity of being able to uh, routinely take uh, direct imaging observations. Uh, but what I'm focusing on in particular is commissioning an interferometric mode at the Large Binocular Telescope down in southern Arizona. It's a weird telescope. It has two 8.4 meter primary mirrors, uh, so you can do weird things with it. And the PSF that you get if you stabilize the observing mode uh, is that, that you see right there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, uh, if, if we do this right, if we stabilize the, uh, the observing mode and we uh, do a good job with our post-processing, we should be able to commission this telescope as if it were a single telescope with a 22.7 uh, meter wide uh, primary mirror. Uh, if we do so, then we should be able to get detail in protoplanetary disks uh, down to a level of, at the distance of AB or, uh, possibly 4 AU, so that's AB or that you see way over on the right-hand side. AB or does not actually look like that, that's just the PSF with the color reversed, uh, and I'm wor working on deconvolution. Um, and uh, this PSF on the left here is uh, Altair. It's a very nearby star. It's not a particularly uh, young star, so you wouldn't typically target it for, uh, or it wouldn't be the lowest hanging fruit for direct imaging surveys, but it's so close that we could be able to uh, get to within 1 AU um, if we use the dark fringes of the PSF. And uh, so stop by my poster and uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Hill. I'm at uh, UC Riverside and finished my first year. And I have been looking at giant planets in the habitable zone and their potential for uh, exomoons. And next slide, please. 
Um, and we started off by looking at the occurrence rates of giant planets in the Hubble zone. So we have our results in the top slide here, and then I compared these to the terrestrial values in the literature, uh, and we found that giant planets are less likely to be found in the Hubble zone of their stars than terrestrial planets. However, if you assume that these planets have moons and that giant planets can host more than one moon, then moons in the Hubble zone could be as plentiful or even more so than terrestrial planets. It would increase the number of worlds in which life could be found accordingly. So then I wanted to answer, why are these giant planets in the Hubble zone of their star? Next slide, please. Uh, and so uh, 121 of these giant planets had radial velocity data, and I ran this through the RV fitting tool RADVEL, uh, and 52 of them showed linear trends, and these trends could be indications of additional large planets in further out orbit. And so currently we're making observations of the best of these uh, candidates to answer whether it is conducive for giant Hubble zone planets to have additional planets in orbit with them. So if you're interested in exomoons or giant planets or Hubble zone planets, come see my poster. Hello everyone, I'm Yang Cheng Luo, a graduate student at Caltech, and uh, today I have a poster presenting my undergraduate study with Professor Yong Yunhu and Professor Jun Yang at Peking University. Our project is about uh, ozone layers on exoplanets. So the atmospheric ozone has great implications for astrobiology because it is formed by the photolysis of oxygen, and oxygen is likely produced by photosynthetic life. Ozone has a great advantage that is spectral features are relatively easier to detect. And also, ozone layers can protect the surface life from potentially harmful UV radiation from M stars. In this study, we used a three-dimensional photochemical climate model to simulate the abundance and the distribution of ozone in the atmosphere of the Earth-like planets in the habitable zones around M dwarfs. M dwarf stars have different UV activities, which are the driving force to uh, ozone chemistry and also the planets in the habitable zones around M, M stars are believed to be tightly locked, which makes the atmospheric circulation and the, the transport of, uh, uh, of trace species completely different from the Earth. We also asked the question whether the ozone layers are detectable and whether they are thick enough to protect the surface life. Next slide, please. Here we show some distinct features of, of ozone distribution in the atmospheres from our simulations. Uh, we, we also demonstrate that the spectral features of the ozone layers are in principle detectable under certain conditions. Also, the planet, uh, the, U, the surface UV environment on the planets around the UV active M stars uh, is safe for Earth-like life. If you are interested in the more detailed analysis of ozone chemistry, please check out my poster and chat with me. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Maria McDonald. I'm a graduate student at Penn State. Um, typically I actually study exoplanets and have for like seven years now, but recently I went into astrobiology um, and started looking into the initiation of plate tectonics. Um, so as we heard yesterday, um, a mobile lid or a planet with plate tectonics might be crucial for a planet to be habitable. Um, that way we have subduction and we can reintroduce material from the top of the planet back into the mantle, and we can maintain this carbonate silicate cycle um, that might be necessary for life. Now, planets with stagnant lids, ooh, sorry, uh, planets with stagnant lids might still be habitable, but maybe on shorter time scales. Um, so it's still very important for us to understand how plate tectonics can get started, maybe on these planets that start out with stagnant lids. So that's what I did. Um, and I explored that using this uh, theory called uh, grain damage or damage theory, which is way cooler than it sounds. Um, but it is, it is um, described by this lovely slash hideous equation um, that is essentially a feedback loop between the grain size and the mantle and also the viscosity. So as deformation drives down grain size, this will reduce your viscosity, which will further um, increase your deformation, which will reduce your grain size, and so on and so forth. And so we can actually get initiation of plate tectonics that way. Um, so I used this uh, mechanism to explore the initiation from stagnant lid planets. And um, if you're interested in potential preliminary results, uh, come see me on the poster. It's number 29. Thank you. Um, 
Hello, everyone. My name is Igor Palupski, and I'm a graduate student from University of California, Irvine. And together with my collaborators, uh, Professor Elma Shields, who's my advisor and who's also giving a talk this Thursday, and Russell Dietrich, we are interested in the effects of eccentricity on the habitability of extrasolar planets. And to this end, we employ a one-dimensional energy balance model, which allows us to um, study a wide range of parameter space. In this case, eccentricity and uh, sort of flux or insulation space. Um, but that's not all. This model also allows us to compare these results or these effects for planets with varying obliquity and different and the stellar types of the and the M, K, G, and F spectral type of the host star. Um, and this is done by varying the broadband albedos of planetary surfaces, such as land, ocean, or ice. Uh, for each of the corresponding host stars. And overall, we find that it's the M dwarf star that is habitable for the largest region, region of this parameter space. That's this region here. Although the region of traditional uh, habitability shrinks with increasing, ex ex with shrinks with increasing, ex increasing eccentricity, what we get instead at these higher eccentricities is a region of temporal habitability. So those are planets that are habitable for a fraction of the year, and in general, they tend to freeze around the Appalachia. So you have a global winter for a few months. Um, so if this, are, if this sounds interesting, or if you would like to, or if you would like to just drop a comment, please come by my poster or talk to me anytime this week. Or if, you, or if you would, if you would like to know more about the water loss limits uh, induced due to the, due to this eccentricity, you have to come by my poster. I did not include that on the slide. Um, so thank you, and yeah. Hi, I'm Ellen Costa de Almeida. I am an undergraduate student from the Federal University of Rio in Brazil, and I work with AMS of stars. Uh, as you know, they became really famous because we're detecting a lot of exoplanets around them. But as you can see in this plot, all the black dots are stars that we are planets that we don't know the age of the whole star. And if you go look for effective temperature, activity, metallicity, you face the same problem. Because they're so cold that you lose, you can see individual lines in the spectra. There's a bunch of molecule, molecular variants, and it's really hard to work with the spectra of these stars. But I'm trying to deal with it anyway. So I observed 300 stars using the 1.6 meter Brazilian telescope in the near infrared region with resolutions of 10,000. And I'm using these two methods, the PCA and the age activity relation, to derive the, the three parameters to, to improve the knowledge about these objects. So if you want to know more about my, my job, uh, please come check my poster. Thank you. Hi, my name is Julian van Eiken. I am one of the members of the uh, science team working on the Exoplanet Archive. I just wanted to give the archive a bit of a plug because there may be a lot of people in this audience that have not run into it before. Um, it's essentially a database of uh, published data on exoplanets. Um, we keep it regularly updated. Um, and in fact, the planet count, we're up to, we just hit 4,000 uh, like two weeks ago, I think. Um, and we're the official planet counter that uh, actually Griffith Observatory uses to keep their live planet counter um, updated for everyone to see. Um, in addition to uh, regular exoplanet parameters and things, we have a whole host of uh, supporting data. So there's Kepler and K2 uh, science products, uh, a lot of data from uh, ground-based, a lot of uh, ground-based surveys. We have radial velocity data, transmission and mission spectra, uh, transit light curves, way more than I can go into here, but um, I'll give you a sense of what there is. I should also shout out that closely uh, related to the exoplanet archive is the uh, exofop, um, community follow-up uh, program, which is an online tool where people from the community can go and uh, upload their observations and observing notes and things on their favorite planets um, or uh, candidates and objects of interest so that people can coordinate their, uh, their follow-up efforts so those become visible to the whole, the whole community. Uh, so that applies to Kepler, K2, and TESS. It's actually the official, uh, part of the official TESS um, follow-up observing program. We have over 800 registered users now, so it's getting some good use. Uh, can we get the next slide? Um, 
So this is just pointing out we have a part of what we do is develop a whole bunch of tools to work with all this uh, data. I won't go into any of that in any detail. I would just mention we have things like uh, ExoFast, which is a, a transit and radial velocity um, time series fitting tool. Uh, we have, for example, a, a, a service that predicts observable signatures for exoplanets uh, that include very simple uh, habitable zone calculations. Um, and also particularly want to shout out that coming very soon, uh, we have uh, the Pi Atmos data set. This is a, a set of 125,000 simulated Earth-like model atmospheres. Oh, I need to stop. I'm, I do apologize. <laughs> um, Daniel Anghausen will talk about that later in the week. I'll shut up. Uh, website is there. Please check it out. We have handouts outside. We don't have a post up, but I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is David Rice. I want to give a shout out to my whole research group in this two minutes uh, because Jason Steffen's research group at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. We've got a pretty big ambitious goal of taking the chemical composition from the solar nebula all the way to the interior of planets with as few or as many jumps in time and first order approximations as we need to get there. So really right now we've got the end members done. Uh, Min Lee has a paper up on Archive, which is their new dust condensation code, which minimizes the Gibbs free energy of 33 elements and over 100 compounds and minerals to understand their distribution in the protoplanetary disk. And on the other side, I'm helping Chen Liang Huang uh, finish up an interior structure code, which is really focused on the uh, experimental equations of states that we can add in from our high pressure lab downstairs. In between, another graduate student, Anna Childs, and I are working on painting these compositions onto a planetesimal disk and then running them and evolving them into the final planets. I'm really interested in the geophysical processes that might happen during those steps. So if you want to come by my poster, number 35, it talks all about mantle erosion, which is this region of parameter space where planetesimals can collide together and preferentially reject the mantle. And you can imagine how that might change the composition of a planetesimal disk. Also on that poster, I've got that ternary diagram up there that shows the different radiuses that a three Earth mass planet might have when it has different percentages of mass in the ice layer, the core layer, and the mantle. So if you want to see that blown up big, if you want to read, learn how to read a ternary diagram, or you want to learn about mantle erosion, come by poster number 35 or catch me anytime. Thanks. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Danica Adams and I'm a graduate student here at Caltech. Uh, this work was motivated by recent measurements of nitrates by the MSL rover. Uh, so this work has kind of two parts to it. First, we're hoping to see how uh, and NOx and HCN could precipitate out of an early Mars atmosphere, and if that could be astrobiologically relevant. Second, uh, we're going to try to compare that with the measurements made by the uh, MSL rover uh, by putting those concentrations to an aqueous chemistry model and seeing if we can constrain the atmospheric composition. So we consider a one-bar atmosphere, mostly of CO2, but we vary the amounts of nitrogen in these reduced gases, which could have been important for the greenhouse. Uh, lightning could have produced NOx, and that would rain out after forming nitric acid. And then the HCN would have been produced via reactions with these radical species that are produced from lightning in both, uh, as well as coronal mass ejection. Uh, so after uh, we produce things with lightning and CMEs, uh, we then put it through a kinetics, which is a 1D photochemistry model with 495 reactions in 50 species. Uh, these are the resulting concentrations that we get from rainout with that model. And you can see that uh, we get uh, HNO produced that rains out uh, would form uh, nit nitrate and nitrite. And those concentrations are about 0 0.1 millimolar. And it's fairly independent of the concentration assumed. So we can uh, place a pretty good constraint of how much uh, nitrate and nitrite could have been in the surface water at Mars. Uh, so please check out my poster. It's number one, and I'd be very excited to talk with you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Alma Ceja. I am getting ready to start the third year of my PhD at the University of California, Riverside, where I work with Dr. Stephen Kane. And we are working together to develop an astroecological model for characterizing exoplanet habitability. Um, so what makes this model unique is that we um, are able to take surface environments of modeled exoplanets and uh, couple that with terrestrial uh, physiology so um, empirically derived physiological limits. Um, so on the right hand, um, 
on my right hand side, you see uh, there is um, an output from the climate model that we work with. It's called Rocky 3D, developed by NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And um, you see a temperature surface map. Um, I specifically pull out temperature because the physiological data that I work with is related to the uh, thermophysiological responses of terrestrial organisms. So I pulled out data from what's known as the biokinetic spectrum for temperature, um, which is plotted on uh, my left. Uh, so on the uh, x-axis, there's temperature. And on the y, um, you see a uh, rate per minute. So that cellular, cellular growth rate per minute. Um, so the idea is that we couple this data um, in a software called NetLogo. Um, so a couple of data, and this is the homepage of the NetLogo, um, of the NetLogo software. So what you see is the environment that has been simulated overlaid with um, biological organisms displaying uh, those uh, temperature properties. So um, the idea is that uh, once this model can be validated to accurately predict terrestrial distribution and abundance, then we can uh, apply it to um, characterizing habitability of measured exoplanets. Uh, so please stop by my poster. There are many more details associated with this. Um, thank you very much.